The Pocket Now Weekly is brought to you by Intercom. Intercom is the business messaging platform that does the manual work for you, automatically qualifying leads and scheduling demos. Their chatbot and messenger free you up to focus on the prospects most likely to convert. You can leave your pipeline to chance or you could use Intercom. Start for free at intercom.com slash growth. That's intercom.com slash G-R-O-W-T-H growth. And we thank them for supporting the Pocket Now Weekly. All right, we're live. And this week, Huawei in hot water again, this time over potential trade sanctions. Motorola is setting their sights high on sales for the G6. Uh, we might have gotten a closer look at the iPhone SE 2. I'm very excited about that. The U.S. government is dragging their heels on repealing net neutrality. And this week, we crack open the Pocket Now mailbag to answer some of your questions. We've got a lot to talk about, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 302 of the Pocket Now Weekly. I recorded April 27th at noon Pacific. This weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile, smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, contributing editor at PocketNow.com. Joined, as always, by plucky podcast producer Mr. J Mr. Jules Wong on the East Coast. How's it going, buddy boy? It's going well. How about you? How's been your week so far? My week's been rad. I, was, I, I would just like to say I'm very excited that I live read through sponsor copy, through the top of the show, <laughs> and I didn't fumble until I got to your name. Yeah, yeah, you know, just the Needed. important parts. You have to satisfy <laughs> the sponsor and then screw up your co-host's name. I like totally. it. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's exactly. It's a it's good exactly. idea. You should keep on doing it. Uh, yeah, just bring that forward as a concept. Keep that going on. I love it. I love it. But no, we should jump right into the show because we've got some really hot news stories. Uh, again, I mean, we're sort of in that in-betweener phase on... on uh, individual device announcements you know getting through a couple different phone reviews right now and then uh we're, we're going to be hitting another sort of harvest season in a couple weeks when uh, a few more devices are coming out it's, but it's never good I, I don't like this i don't like having to divide my attention in a certain week to like five different devices that are launching at the same time and it's just it's crazy and then there's like the starving period that you have to deal with mm -hmm. between you know, the like no, this know. one and next one. You would think it would be a little bit more like movie releases where a manufacturer would be like, Hey, when's LG releasing their phone? Well, we've got another little phone. We should launch it the same day. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, that's a bad idea. Or or also, you know, like, hey, when's Apple gonna be taking the wraps off the new iPhone? Let's release three days before them. No, like you had this whole month leading up where you could have had the spotlight all to yourself, but instead it's like, Well, we need the summer blockbuster, the tent pole phone announcement. That's that's not how any of this works. No, this is not Nissan's uh, tent tent sales event thing going on. Like <laughs> whatever the heck they're doing. Oh, the before my voiceover sales. days, I have done so many castings for every single automobile manufacturer. <laughs> I'm like the summer sales event, the big tent event, and you're like, oh, this is terrible. Well, if you want to get into your own oh. consumer sales tent event, you want to get into a powwow with us, actually, uh, you can do so on Twitter via the hashtag PN Weekly. I'm also monitoring the YouTube chat, although uh, I won't be paying as much attention to that as much as uh, Pocket Now Weekly, uh, PN Weekly on the Twitters, because I can actually read the comments and they're, they're here and they stay there until I scroll. So that's that's actually cool um sorry about that youtube chat but if you want to <laughs> head into uh your email client and ask a few questions like that or have a few opinions that you want to share mm -hmm. just as uh, some of our friends here have sent in you can do so just send it to a uh, p uh podcast i have to remember the thing podcast at pocketnow.com and uh, we'll be able to answer those uh, at the end of every month so you can do that and uh, have your say and we get to respond to your say and then and then it, it continues on the con conversation continues on well and i know it's like we always struggle to remember our own email address but i promise you we do read it and the proof that we do is that at the end of this month or the end of every month, we try and do a mailbag episode. And we've got uh, a couple of really cool emails to talk about here. Uh, some really techie, geeky, in the weed stuff that I like to talk about. So uh, we'll have we'll have a fun wrap-up discussion after all the major news. Yeah. But uh, speaking of, like that's kind of what I was getting back to, is we had a couple really interesting news stories pop up this week that are going to be fun to chew up a little bit. And so uh, I think we should jump in. 
uh, top news stories from pocketnow.com this week. Jules, you want to uh, help us run through this uh, this list of of articles and periodicals and topics <laughs> periodicals are are you talking about like the the mag like the what are periodicals in the newspaper again like i don't i don't even remember what the reading newspaper was like anyways for <laughs> the week of april 23 2018 this is all the news that is fit to podcast we start off with huawei as with zte uh getting some brushback from the government huawei is now another uh, Chinese uh, telecoms company that is under investigation by the Department of Justice uh, for sanction breaching uh, with uh, doing business in Iran and uh, details about this have yet to uh, be fully emerged as of right now but we'll be keeping track of that and uh, we'll be talking about some of the reactions still as uh, this whole uh, regime of uh, you know building tensions with China in economy and as well as cybersecurity uh, goes on. So we'll be talking about that in just a few minutes. Motorola in the meantime has announced that its Moto G series has amassed 70 million sales over the past five years of the series and it hopes to reach nine digits with the help of the Moto G6 and uh, the G6 Play, G6 Plus over the next year, hoping to target 30 million more Moto G sales. We'll see how many of the new models uh, make up that total. In the meantime, more from the iPhone SE 2. We're now hearing that it's coming up to launch uh, probably next month, and we're seeing a 17-second video released onto Chinese video sharing site Miaopi as uh, it uh, shows off a headphone jack, some glass, as it has been rumored that this thing will get uh, wireless charging of some sort. But uh, again, these details are pretty sketchy at the moment, and uh, it's a pretty blurry video. So uh, lots to take, uh, especially with that salt that you have over there. Uh, Sprint and T-Mobile, again, uh, going into merger uh, territory here. Uh, word to Reuters now is that they are close to a deal. Uh, SoftBank and Deutsche Telekom, the parent companies of Sprint and T-Mobile, are uh, just hashing out how much voting control each company will get. And uh, we could have a deal announced by next week at the earliest. In the meantime, Xiaomi has uh, announced that it will move to limit profit margin goals uh, with a top limit of 5% after tax. And if it ever achieves uh, net profit margins above 5%, it will, quote, distribute uh, the excess to its uh, customers in a reasonable fashion. Now, keep in mind that Xiaomi is going through an IPO process. It wants to uh, be able to expand its reaches globally, but being able to do so with its low margin tactic might prove difficult. So it has a tight wire to uh, balance on at the moment right now. Apple is being accused of some antitrust uh, concerns that coming from the European Commission, it is looking into the company's acquisition of Shazam, music identifying service, and uh, the potential is there that upon acquisition of uh, Shazam, that Apple could use the data, existing data from referrals to other music streaming services as a competitive advantage against players like Google Play Music or Spotify. They have about 90 working days to reach a conclusion uh, in conclusion and are expected to do so on or before September 4. The U.S. government has yet to approve the FCC's repeal of net neutrality. Now, that's not to say that the FCC has not passed uh, the bill, the Restoring Internet Freedom Act, and that some of those provisions have already come into place on April 23rd. But some of uh, the measures that have been listed on the act need budgetary approval from the Office of Management and Budget under the Trump White House. And uh, that has yet to happen. Now, we do know that uh, there has been plenty of uh, vacancies in the federal government, and uh, that has slowed down some of the work that's being done by it. 
just everyday work. Uh, we also know that it's a midterm election year, and that could have uh, possible effects as to how an industry law might take place if uh, new rules were to be drafted and uh, sent through co Congress. Uh, there might be a change in how uh, the Republican uh, controlled legislatures uh, might be able to handle that, especially if they do turn blue uh, in September. And finally, Windows 10 Mobile, still alive after uh, having been called dead again. Uh, reports have said that uh, Microsoft, the Microsoft Store Online, has uh, run out of uh, Windows 10 mobile phones to sell, the last two models being the HP Elite X3 and uh, the Alcatel Idle 4S with Windows. Of course, that uh, stock outage was temporary, and now they're back up and uh, on the store. Uh, for what it matters, HP has said that it would continue selling the Elite X3 through 2019. So... Even though Windows 10 Mobile has been at a development a developmental uh, dead end for quite a few months now, uh, I don't know. Is it still nice to see something still kicking around? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. No, I, it's it's the frustration of having had this really elegant user interface, some really great ideas from Microsoft and being ahead of the curve. I, I mean, like Microsoft is consistently ahead of the curve on a lot of this stuff. HoloLens, Connect, uh, Voice Assistant, and then they let that fruit wither on the vine, fall behind their competition, and then they have to play catch up. While we're still consistently seeing rumors of a potential Surface phone, of new implementation of Windows 10 for ARM chipsets and LTE always on connected devices. And this is this is getting a little tiresome of the uh, of the evacuate your bowels or get off the pot mentality. Either be a part of mobile or don't, but stop stringing people along with these kinds of products. Like I, I would be very upset to be a part of the Microsoft ecosystem with this little consistency for uh for consumer solutions yeah i mean especially as uh, the oems are just being left out to dry here and that windows is basically saying we're moving forward uh i do want to catch a tangential uh, piece to this uh uh song and that is uh, yeah, with the itunes app uh finally mm -hmm. appearing on windows 10 a year, nearly a year after Windows 10s launched with its app-only uh, ecosystem, and uh, and it launched with the Surface laptop. And I'm not sure if this is a if uh, people are still on Windows 10s or if they've just decided to um, uh, forsaken <laughs> if they've forsaken it and just gone on to Windows 10. But uh, what do you think? Too little, too late? No, I don't think so. Uh, 10, uh, Windows 10 S shifting from being a primary uh, operating system platform to being a setting now. So any any Windows 10 device, you can flip it into sort of a 10 S mode. Uh, it's shifting, so but the full implementation won't happen until like next year. Well, no, that that's what I mean is is is. I look at Windows 10s. What what Windows 10s was going to be was an app only interface with the Windows ecosystem that was going to be sold that way. But I think there is some merit for a 10s mode on every single Windows 10 device. Like I could look at an ultra light touch screen modular style PC, and maybe that could become a really good grandparent computer where it doesn't matter what the hardware is, I can go into the settings and say, hey, now you're in 10S mode. I don't want you letting my grandparents install programs that they click on in ads in their web browser. I just only want you to use apps uh, and, and limit what they can have access to. Having a, an app ecosystem or a Windows 10 store, I think makes sense for that. And then pushing forward, if Microsoft ever can, deliver a strategy for mobility focused products mobility first focused products arm chipset devices and you don't have to recompile stuff then i think that that's an ecosystem worth supporting again it keeps coming back to a conversation about microsoft and potential and they've got a ton of potential i could see four or five 
uh, like significant paths that they could take to get back into mobile to they could get uh, into better modular setups into better uh, um, uh, multi mode and mixed mode usage scenarios. But really, it's will they pick one? Will they actually iterate on it? Will they improve it? And that's where I always feel Microsoft fumbles the ball is the consistency of the approach of the approach and then also learning from their mistakes, iterating and improving upon their mistakes and moving forward in a way that consumers can can grasp. Well, it's always the danger of the third parties too. I mean, we're talking about Apple in this specific case with the iTunes app. And this was announced at the launch of the Surface Laptop, at the launch of Windows 10 S last May. We got word that it was delayed or that development had been suspended indefinitely. Mm -hmm. uh in december and uh, now it's finally taken so long to just get a basic window uh win32 bridge over uh to uh, this little app that we have right now i mean yeah that's I, that's that's kind of one of the things i'm pointing to that we would all agree that's disappointing progress but the fact of the matter is is that they are still getting something out so what do we see we see a microsoft that's sort of dipping their toe into a platform or a consumer product release strategy that the company doesn't seem to have a lot of faith in. Uh, for, for all of the goodwill that the Surface team has managed to buy Microsoft in terms of consumer hardware, we don't see strategies that they can build off of in a meaningful fashion, timely execution, consistent iteration. And we keep coming back to these kinds of discussions. You know, you announced something a year and a half ago. Now we have it. And that's, I mean, that is kind of cool. We're seeing cross-platform compatibility on one of you know, Apple's primary services in a way that might help move the needle on making Windows 10 more of an app-focused uh, ecosystem. But we need to see that across the board. We need to see that consistency with a ton of other developers. We need to see Microsoft delivering hardware that takes advantage of this, not just uses it as a compromise or uses it as sort of, de of a default mode, uh, like they tried to position the the Surface Laptop as being something of a lesser device in terms of backwards compatibility. There are advantages to to working mobile first, and I don't see where Microsoft has really embraced that. No, and especially well, I mean, they've kind of uh, backed themselves into that third position uh, out of uh, Android and iOS, and uh, just realized, okay, well, we're going to uh, announce these bridging initiatives, and uh, they completely dropped the ball on the Android oh. front. <laughs> and uh, iOS, well, it's like, okay, ish, but that's that really doesn't, you know, that's beyond the point now um, in 2018. So, uh, yeah, and with what was it, the numbers uh, from uh, this week, 32% uh, increase in Surface sales over a year ago? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, that, that, a lot of that, that may have to do with the uh, Surface laptop or something. So they are achieving, for a software company, they are achieving a lot in hardware. But well, it's and, a, and the management is, of both. Yeah, but this is also what becomes so frustrating is... We saw them go through their Windows Phone days, Windows Phone 7 to Windows Phone 8 to Windows Phone 10 or Windows 10 for mobile, whatever they wanted to call it. And we saw them learn and stick it out in the market for Surface. There really wasn't anything that I feel could have prevented Microsoft from emulating some of their success in Surface for smartphone uh, for for their smartphone platforms and at the same time we yet again keep pointing to microsoft as being this safe consistent company shareholders feel very comfortable with microsoft they tend not to do too many radical things to their main money makers but we've got microsoft has i feel the best potential for executing a one operating system cloud focused services focused strategy especially with the server guy at the helm with uh, Nadella at the helm of Microsoft, he's been ruthlessly focused on making services available across all screens. And your Microsoft account follows you really well, regardless of what hardware platform you end up on. Um, the fact that they haven't seen, th th that the disparate teams at Microsoft haven't fully realized the hardware success strategy of the Surface team and applied it to other areas is what's so critically disappointing about the way that they're engaging with consumers right now. Except for Azure, for some reason, their servers are just exploding out of the out of the water. It's it's great for them, hooray for, for <laughs> Azure, but whatever, I mean. Sure.
I mean, yeah. but again, I mean, what, what what we're talking about here is a more consumer facing product, yeah. which again, the their acumen, their experience in the corporate and their the the server infrastructure market would do really well for for moving the needle on consumer services and consumer solutions. We've got a comment here from Andrew Sislak, uh, hashtag PN Weekly, uh, Windows Mobile whatever we're going to call it, because it'll probably be something like that again. Uh, Windows Mobile will make sense when they make Windows free. Again, Windows as a service is a viable platform, is a viable strategy in the way that we've been positioning a lot of these other pieces of software, app development, and uh, consumer services. Uh, m moving it that way, where Windows suddenly competes on the same pricing tier as Android, but will likely have a tighter reign over things like software updates, could be really compelling. That could be a significant consumer benefit. But again, I, I don't think Microsoft has earned any trust there right now. They would likely have to lose bad in the market with any kind of cell phone strategy for at least three generations of product before yeah. anyone would start to take them seriously. And that's exactly when Microsoft in the past has decided to pull the plug on a lot of these products and initiatives. Just as they start getting into like, you know, high single digit, low double digit, market penetration is exactly when they go oh not good enough and you're like we were showing growth with nokia you were like 10 to 12 percent throughout most of europe you were starting to get into four to five percent in the united states i was seeing lumia phones in the wild from non-techie uh individuals and that's when you decided to throw a bucket of cold water on it makes I don't know. Sense. The, 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 the cliff of expenses just might have kicked in at two and a half years i don't know <laughs> their their time frames are kind of uh, ridiculous in any case yeah. that's my opinion uh out of left here uh left field here no life 2692 on the chat i am still using the original surface rt well mm -hmm. i'm sorry about that that <laughs> <laughs> so I, I need to fire it up. Um, I just found uh, it, it's it's in my bedroom right now. I'd run out and go grab it. I, I didn't know we'd be digging this deep. I just found my Lumia 2520, which is still a gorgeously built uh, tablet. And then on my bookshelf, I don't I don't think I can move. No, nope, I can't. I can't move enough to, no. to show it. But I, I have my Surface 2 RT. Um, uh, back there. Well, I'm sorry for that too. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, been, I've been curious to see, you know, like if if I can, if I can get it charged, because I, I think actually on my surface, I think the battery's dead. I haven't checked, like proper dead, like the thing's just completely. Uh, it just went uh, good. Yeah. Uh, uh, if if I can, I, I'm curious to see if any of those Windows RT devices have gotten any kind of significant upgrade with more app support, Windows 10 ecosystem or environment like I, if they were completely abandoned um because that's a shame you know the 2520 actually has hardware in it right now that would do fairly well with some of the strategy okay. that they're discussing it's lte enabled um it's a lower power chipset so you wouldn't you don't have that windows on arm running on a qualcomm 835 but it should do fine for an app first ecosystem product if if it even has an upgrade potential for windows 10 which i doubt i don't know i think we're still we're we're running away from the just the tablet only like just the, as a form factor as a slab where uh, convertibles and you know just something with a keyboard or a stylus is all is more important these days so there you go um in terms of huawei uh nothing in particular really is showing up here for a moment that we can discuss other than just adding on to the bone pile of uh, this uh, whole fight between the U.S. government and the Chinese uh, over trade, over cybersecurity, over just a whole bunch of things here. Yeah, so where I've been somewhat skeptical about the government's response to Huawei's consumer division uh, especially with the law enforcement advisory, which came out a couple months ago. This to me is a bigger deal from a company wide perspective. And it's the same, it's the same feeling I had with ZTE. Uh, I, I felt that some of the allegations of, of consumer facing device security were a little bit specious. Um, 
given that we had no evidence that there was any actual wrongdoing on the part of ZTE or Huawei in protecting consumer data. At the same time, we've seen numerous other Chinese manufacturers violate sort of the sanctity of the uh, manufacturer consumer relationship by um, improperly protecting consumer data. This is a little bit bigger deal. And, and the same reason why it's a major bummer when it hits a company I like, like ZTE or Huawei. But if this is an organization which has been violating trade sanctions or has been breaking embargoes or has ties to governments that our Justice Department is going to deem unfriendly, then we need a more critical uh, in-depth examination of the corporate business practices. Whether or not I, I feel like this is going to affect individual consumer security, I still don't see a smoking gun there. But if if Huawei went down this path in the same way that ZTE, ZTE did several years ago and then broke the terms of their settlement on, on going down this route, then yeah, unfortunately, I do feel a, a larger hammer has to drop on the company. It just sounds like we're at the beginnings of that investigation where ZTE had already been found um, to be violating trade sanctions and then lying about their uh, their role in future violations of trade sanctions. Yeah, uh, lying about the role of uh, the, how they carried out the punishment. They were supposed to punish uh, several senior executives and they were found to have not. Right, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, uh, like it sucks as a consumer to be talking about things that should be over our heads that shouldn't have to you know affect us i mean you know iran you know what, what's the deal with that like i don't really care just give me my damn phone but in terms of just having to deal with the government and uh, uh the whole thing with dumping of steel imports and whatnot like that's yeah. it's it, it comes it's, it's it, it comes back yeah Oh, totally. Now, I, the nice thing is, and and because, you know, this is one of those things where I feel like those of us who are enthusiasts in this kind of tech space, the nice thing is, I don't feel that the consumers who have already gone out there and purchased products from these companies are likely going to be overtly negatively affected by the upper governmental responses to things like trade sanctions. So, I, that's a really long-winded way of me saying, let's say Huawei is found guilty of doing some really underhanded or dirty business things with companies or I mean, with countries that have embargoes or trade sanctions against them. And they they befall a similar punishment that ZTE did, where it's going to be a seven-year uh, moratorium on U United States-backed technologies. Let's say you bought a P20 Pro. Your P20 Pro should still be fine. <laughs> like I, I don't I don't foresee where the fallout from this type of trade sanction or this type of breach is going to impact someone who's already bought into a particular ecosystem. It's just unfortunate. And it means that your your next upgrade will likely have to come from a different manufacturer. But this is kind of still the best possible scenario for someone who is an early adopter from one of these companies uh, not being uh, completely cut out. I don't foresee a near-term uh, embargo placed on carriers blocking these products from being on their networks. Like, I don't think tomorrow T-Mobile is going to suddenly blacklist all Huawei products um, from operating on their LTE towers. Like, that to me doesn't seem a likely outcome in the near term. I mm. uh, want to just hit a quick note about that uh, Moto uh, G. I just in the yeah. overtones of um, uh, five years of Moto G, which is in itself a, an accomplishment for a mid range uh, series. Uh, and uh, it, I mean, great news for them. Uh, I feel like uh, the mission, overall mission, is still there, but I feel kind of uh, bummed that the realities of uh, the components market or, and like the expected feature set of a mid ranger, I, th that, that price has gone up a little bit. And, um, and it, it, I mean, it could, I don't believe um, uh, we're, we're going up to like near $300 as, as, as opposed to 180. So yeah. that's just my well, little complaint there. 
Oh, no. I, I, and I totally appreciate that, too. I mean, that, that comes into a longer and, and probably not appropriate for our podcast discussion about, like, you know, uh, economic policy and inflation. No, and, yeah, and, totally. And, totally. And, and, and I'm, I am not. We already have enough of that going on elsewhere. <laughs> I, I am perfectly willing to jump into that conversation while also absolutely acknowledging that I'm probably not educated enough to meaningfully uh, discuss a lot of that stuff. Uh, but yeah. um, I got to say. What what makes me excited is the Moto G series helped introduce a conversation in Android that Windows Phone was really good at the sub three hundred dollar uh, product that wasn't an absolute misery to use, and it's evolved and iterated phenomenally well. There are several family members. My sister is is a perfect example. She just finished grad school. I've told this story a bunch of times. Moto G four. She's happy. She she has a phone that does everything she needs it to do. If it gets completely smashed, she's not out a significant amount of money. In fact, replacing the entire phone is probably less costly than replacing the back glass on a newer Samsung. So she's happy. Um, my wife uh, destroyed her current flagship phone. And out of all the devices that I handed to her blind, because I didn't tell her, you know, this is an entry level phone. This is a mid ranger. This is a flagship. She, her her phone is a G5s. That was the phone that, after kind of poking around uh, uh, the user interface for a little while, uh, using each device for a little while, she she ended up on a two hundred and fifty dollar Moto. The Moto G5s was her pick, um, free of any other influence from me telling her this is a good phone, this is a bad phone. And so, if we could see a Moto G6 that kind of follows in that footsteps, I, I'm very positive on this uh, and uh, this tier of the market. Alongside phones like the Honor 7X, so long as Honor can continue to sell devices to North America, um, those products helping to shift a part of the conversation away from the desire of spending eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars on a smartphone, like what you would pay and more for towards it. the desire of an HTC desire, RIP. I, you know what? I, I think now would be the right play for HTC to start pushing entry level and mid ranger hardware in the United States and build back up some of their consumer goodwill. You release a phone that's really good at two to three hundred dollars, and you've got an argument, a solid argument for folks like, what are you doing with your thousand dollar phone? Really look at your behavior because you might be doing just as well on a product which, which costs a third as much as a, a top end. Uh, high-end flagship device. And and I think it's also going to be kind of on us geeks to once again kind of help spread the word on some of that to family members where that conversation is appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. The G6 at least will hopefully be a product worth bringing up in the context of that conversation like the Honor 7X was. Yeah. I mean, the, the, again, the, the focus on the premium has always been about, uh, well, for... for for security hawks, it's always been about uh, software updates and making sure that those mm -hmm. patches happen. And as we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, that uh, omissions, uh, the omissions of patches in okay. certain updates has been uh, a little bit worrisome for the lower end. So, uh, yeah, rotaries it, and roundabouts. It, it is it is definitely a conversation of pros and cons and, and where you can accept risk. But also, I, I think a major component of that has to come down to consumer behavior. Yeah. You know, it, again, if you've got a limited use outlook on what you do with a smartphone, then you're probably already protecting your device better just through the lack of use on certain services <laughs> and certain and certain platforms. So, that, that, yeah. but again, that's why that's why those of us who are enthusiasts, those of us who are geeks, need to approach this not just from this is a cheap phone, this is is an expensive phone, this is a, a nice phone, this is a crappy phone, but more. Who, what is the likely behavior of the person you're talking to and finding the best possible fit for them? And given the pros and cons on something like you said, like security, I still feel there are plenty of people in my circles of family and friends who are low risk individuals in terms of how they share information online and would benefit from saving five, six hundred dollars on a phone given those compromises. I'm with Natsu here on the YouTube chat. I do wish phone prices overall would uh, start dropping again. I mean, it's just a, it's a bummer, but um, yeah. Well, and, that's, and that's uh, also, you know, like, I wouldn't be too upset about some of these, some of these moves. Uh, like Motorola pushing the G a little bit more upscale is still only relative. It's still great. Yeah. Well, it's no, still relatively. It's still yeah. only relative to them having the Moto E. 
And there are still benefits why someone might pick a Moto E over a Moto G. Uh, not, not the least of which is an even lower powered chipset, often with an even bigger battery, you know? So like if, if you've got someone in your target, you know, in your, in your help me buy a phone conversation and they're saying like, I do very little, but I need to have a reliable device. that's going to last all day, maybe even two days. I'm not the type of person who takes care of these things very well. I'm not that tech savvy. I'm not going to sit here and babysit uh, a high end phone, something there is a, a good faith um, argument to be made for why a Moto E would be an even better uh, fit for someone like that. And now we're talking about 200 and below. You know, so we are at that, you know, a C note in change gets you an entry level phone experience, which isn't miserable. It's not nice. It's not a flagship phone, but it's not miserable to use that if you just need to plug through the basics and comes with the benefit of having ridiculously long battery life. Be, especially considering you're not going to do a lot on that phone. I feel like we've come into one of those exclusion triangles where you can pick two, but not the other one. It's oh, just absolutely. like, one those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's just totally complaining have. about it. Oh yeah. Totally yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you there. We, we completely have. It's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, a couple of, from the PN weekly hashtag on Twitter, uh, Peter Hayton in response to Andrew Sislak's earlier comment about uh, making windows free was the cost ever really the problem though. Uh, some of their best phones were super low cost. I genuinely, uh, genuinely think the app gap and lack of continuity between updates really killed Windows Mobile, and they need uh, this. They need to fix. And uh, Andrew R Wallace sort of as a uh, parallel to that. I honestly don't see much of a future for Windows on mobile until the industry moves past app focused functionality. Actually, that's um, a great point yeah. too, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, because I, I don't because we're so, I'm so in it right now so into you know the, you know just focusing on specific programs specific apps I don't right now I don't see the 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 the, the forest from the from the trees well the trees but there but there are tantalizing little hints you know because because I agree with you Jules like in this present time and I would say through 2020 I don't see anything significantly moving the needle on this really tired metaphor that we're currently using of touch square get service and it and it really was i i mean like apple wasn't wrong steve jobs wasn't wrong on the original iphone that if we had better data connectivity having a more robust web browser would have been a bigger benefit than all of these little mini installable programs that function like light versions of the web page services you already interact with but when we see these tantalizing little clues these little hints as to what could be coming up next things like progressive web apps start to make a pretty significant impact on the way that Android manages mobile services and how you interact between web browser or, or, or standalone app. Downloading tiny pieces of executable program, uh, executable code, just to fill in the gaps on what a mobile web browser can actually utilize. That could be what we need to move Windows into more of a Chrome style uh, mobile space. Again, that's a huge amount of potential that I don't believe Microsoft can fully realize and execute on. But, but I mean, to Andrew's point, we're already heading in that direction. I don't want a ton of little apps. I'm perfectly happy with a web browser first uh, solution as long as I don't lose functionality and progressive web apps get me to that without having to permanently install a bunch of things I need to hunt through. It's just a different metaphor for organizing my services and then probably interacts better with things like voice controls. So if I could have a smarter assistant that could launch, you know, a web browser and take me to a bookmark in my browser, and that's a service that I really use, that to me is more beneficial than going to an app drawer and loading up an app and running the service that way. I see Android instant apps as a transition, just app slicing in general as a, as a good transition of all that. But in terms of just getting beyond that that's kind of we're kind of in the wild west of things and uh i think scared. that's going to be i think that's going to be a big fight the metaphor for how we interact with a service is going to be the major showdown between google microsoft and apple because i think in the first generations as we shift away from android into whatever fuchsia style os system they use when we go from Windows to Andromeda, and when Apple finally gets over themselves and merges iOS with uh, Mac OS, every company, every one of those three is gonna have a different metaphor for how a consumer interacts with their data. 
And that'll be, I think, the, the major determining factor on who wins. And there's every opportunity that we might see some kind of outside disruptor. You know, like a Linux might pop back up into the consumer mindshare in a meaningful way through a, a manufacturing partner. A Tizen could walk into the space if Samsung decides to allocate those kinds of resources to really shake up how consumers think about using their products and using their services on the go. But again, these are all really big ifs, and I seriously doubt we'll see anything significant significant on this until uh, at least post-2020. Some contrarian part of me wishes that dis distance was still a factor in the digital. Like, you, you have to actually go out to the store or to a diner and get food and get life and get whatever the heck. Like that's just, but that's just me. You don't, you, you can't just keep scrolling here and there and what, what you know, just, it's it, it's it's not practical it's know, not I mean, like it, it, we just got to make a bigger play on ar you know like hey you could yeah. you could grubhub this or you can also get your ar points to go to your favorite diner and like have you seen the video about like that uh it, it was like an art project where it's just bombardment of ads and uh like the and <laughs> surreal like you have well, to check your it, points and then the woman gets hacked uh, out of her identity and then has to restart all, all over again or something well, I, I, uh, well, the one I remember is someone who, uh, there, there were two jokes when Google Glass first came out and they had that fake ad a day in glass or whatever it was called. And Google was nowhere near close to giving us that as a real AR platform, which is a major bummer. They, they completely oversold the imagination of what glass could be. Um, yeah. but there was, Domenico, the, uh, I talked about that last week. And also there was a Tom Scott who had a, mm -hmm pretty pretty good <laughs> but, but there were, video there were just two uh, parody videos on that one was like the actual google ad adsense version of glass where you have <laughs> pop-ups and ads throughout the entire video and my favorite one was the windows a day in microsoft class where it was like things would lag or you would see like they drag a cursor out of the way and it would have like the after image of all of the different you know windows <laughs> merging and then a blue screens of death at the end of the video it was pretty funny um but Dear but Lord. i mean like Again, it's funny because those kinds of parodies aren't completely wrong. When when iOS and Mac OS merge in a more significant fashion, it's probably going to piss off both iOS and Mac OS fans. You know, you, you, it's really difficult. It's it's exceedingly difficult to manage a transition like that well. So it's every opportunity for the entire market to be flipped upside down while we wait to see what actually resonates with consumers. Consumers don't like change. They like to feel that something's newer and flashier and sexier. But they kind of want things to work exactly the way that they've always used them in the past. And anytime that you shift, you change the location of a button, you remove a home button, you change a, a button to a gesture, people react viscerally negatively. So uh, it, this is dicey territory for all three. All right. So uh, we've been skirting around this for a little bit now. Uh, iPhone SE 2. Yeah. I think uh, I, I'm going to give you 60 seconds for you to just vent out whatever you need to vent out because... This the, again. We're not talking about release yet. We're not talking about any specific dates and you know what to look forward to. It's just a 17 second video. That I, I should probably just give you 17 seconds, but I'm very being very generous here. So uh, 60 seconds, and they start now. If we maintain the same overall form factor and shell, I'm going to be very excited. I still think iOS has not managed the transition to larger screen sizes very well, and it's at home best in a one thumb style environment. This could be an epic little Mighty Mouse de device, and I would be sad to see it go to glass back. I don't feel that there's a particularly uh, there's any strong benefit there, even with wireless charging over the loss of durability. But this is a product segment that I think still uh, does well for consumers who want a portable one handed device and are looking at a more reasonable price point with ios running on more modern hardware so i hope that this is what the uh the phone is actually going to resemble and are you an up and down or, or down on the headphone jack still being there well that's that's the biggie if they if they keep the same form factor i really hope that that they they maintain one not only the headphone jack um but two the uh flush camera sensor I really don't think Apple design has has improved since the iPhone 5. I think it's been downhill. I think the iPhone 5 represents the peak 
This is peak iPhone. This is the best of what Apple has ever des uh, delivered from a design perspective. And uh, it's little touches like that. It's the little accents. I don't like camera bumps and bulges on these, you know, increasingly large phones, minimizing the barest minimum battery that they can get away with in a mobile device. The iPhone 5 and the iPhone SE had all of this better years ago. They delivered all of this correctly long before uh, we got to this possible refresh on an iPhone SE 2. I definitely agree. 2013 was peak iPhone year for Apple. Except for the 5C. I'm not sure about that. I mean, it ended up... No, that's it, it was a, That's definitely a big misstep. Because uh, I'm like in like I'm viewing this with retrospect, but you know, I think it was a good faith, a good a good faith attempt. But at the time, so. it, at, no, the at the time, yeah. time I, at the time, the iPhone 5C made me crazy angry because it broke the cycle of iPhone trust. I uh, you you could always trust on Apple refreshing with the S and then selling the the last year number model at a lower price and then you would have a continuity of accessories. The second I saw a plastic iPhone and it was detailed that it wouldn't be compatible with iPhone 5 cases, with iPhone 5 covers, with a handful of iPhone 5 mounts, that to me was an instant it was was an instant violation of that of that um, iPhone continuity, uh, you 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 suddenly had a you you made a less desirable iPhone for the purposes of making a less desirable iPhone, and you were showing off with the manufacturing and construction of that phone. This was a consumer who is lesser. This is a consumer who spent less on their product, and it doesn't blend in with what we're doing now. Whereas if you you hold up an iPhone SE, you know people just think you have an old iPhone, but it was still a nice iPhone, you know, that was a good iPhone. It wasn't one of these plasticky, gaudy iPhones that that look tacky. So for me, it's always been you, you keep that through line, you keep that continuity and you don't punish your consumers for buying a less expensive product. You just make sure that you're building a product that you can still, you know, wow. deliver consumer nice classes in full um, effect here. No, man. But, it, but it's like you still you, there wasn't there wasn't anything preventing Apple from building in a profit margin and maintaining the iPhone five. You know, it's they tried to make a cheap iPhone and they ultimately arrived at making sort of a consumer punishing cheap iPhone. No one want, or no, I shouldn't say no one, but fewer people wanted that. And then we saw sales of the iPhone five continue through a lot of markets in the world. And then the iPhone SE comes out. And again, it's not going to be a top seller. It's not going to have a huge impact on their overall iOS sales, but it's been a fairly consistent performer for people who want smaller form factor device, better one thumb, or just a cheaper, a less expensive iPhone. And it doesn't broadcast. This is the cheap iPhone. And like that kind of psychology matters when Apple builds so much of their product rep on that emotional response to their products. I don't know about that. Well, I don't, uh, maybe, but I think it's more, I, the iPhone green, it's taken off. It's more green it's bubble. It's more, it's, 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 and it's more anti green bubble than anti plastic cheap case, whatever the heck. Oh, I think does. all of those things go together, but we see cheap older iPhones still being sold. We don't see any off tangential lines of plastic iPhones being sold. Now, I think the market spoke, whatever the actual reasons per consumer as a, as a whole, as a market, plastic iPhones don't sell. So old iPhones sell fa fairly well. Uh, that that I think is at least the last rule that we can hold to. But those were my feelings at launch, and they're still my feelings today. And every time I, because I have an iPhone 5C, and every time I pick up my iPhone SE, it's a wonderful little Mighty Mouse of a phone. I love the build. I love how snappy it is. I love how well it performs. It's a little Mighty Mouse of a gadget. Um, while I had the iPhone 5C, it felt like a tacky cheap phone. So for the winter, uh, not not the holiday quarter, but the winter after uh, it debuted, it got about thirty uh, a quarter of uh, all iPhone sales. The iPhone five C did. So I mean, it was a failure in that sense, but mm -hmm. I mean, it still did decently well. And I don't did, know. Did, and did it say what the what the sales on that were though? Because iPhone uh, twelve point eight sales. of uh, five of uh, fifty one million. So. I'd be curious to see how that goes year after year, because I remember the year before Apple launched the iPhone SE, their year over year on the iPhone 5 was somewhere around 20 something million sales. 
on older iPhones. And I don't know if the 5C was a part of that smaller form factor sales estimate or if it was just based on the iPhone 5 and the iPhone 5S. So I'd have to look up those numbers. But I, 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 mean, I want to say that when the SE was announced, they made the claim that 30 million of their iPhone sales the year previous had been generated by smaller form factor iPhones. I mean, it was, again, the, this is with context that Apple was uh, so much more bigger of a beast in terms of just emphasizing iPhone at that point. But uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of looking at this from like sepia toned glasses here. So... <laughs> No, I was always take, angry take about a, it. Take, take, take of me what you will. Uh, Sprint, T-Mobile, uh, again, this is happening. Uh, there could be a possibility that uh, the Department of Justice may have a little bit more scrutiny against uh, anything happening in the U.S. cellular industry at the moment because it is looking into AT&T or Verizon and the GSMA for colluding on carrier walking rules for the eSIM standard but yep. uh again this is this is about money this is about being able to it's about quality of competition versus just having a, a quantity of competition um what do you think i i think that there's a pretty good chance this will go through because we're talking about the third and fourth place carriers a significant amount of resources are being tied up by the at&t and verizon collusion uh accusations and that I, I don't know that they'll they'll de they'll deliver the same kind of regulatory scrutiny with this administration um, on these two companies. I, I think if there's any any potential for a last gasp before the midterm elections, regulatory policy actually pushing through some kind of merger or acquisition, this one actually looks like it's got the legs to make it. We've been hearing about this on again, off again. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Sam and Diane kind of uh, <laughs> joining of these two companies for so long that I think consumers are sort of over it. Anyone who would be overly concerned about Sprint and T-Mobile joining forces likely just doesn't care that much as it, you know, especially compared to AT&T yeah. and Dish or uh, AT&T. Or just AT&T in the yeah. case of Donald Trump, because of yeah. course they're going <laughs> right? Time Warner, CNN. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this one I think actually has a higher degree there, there's there's a higher uh, likelihood of this one just sneaking through uh because people will act like the stakes are much lower even though we're still talking about humongous multi-billion dollar corporations uh joining forces where we should be delivering exactly the same kind of scrutiny even though sprints like a, di a distant fourth place and t-mobile has been a pretty scrappy third place uh you know i i think this one this one could slide yeah in terms of impact to services uh, i mean uh well it, especially with the regulatory picture being as it is i'm not sure what kind of discounts they'll have to make in terms of spectrum in terms of whatever uh that they have to do in order to be compliant but it's just uh, is well, does this make i mean it, it, ideally we would have a third place some sort of a state where it could be more in the lines of a hundred million subscribers and they'd be able to carry their own weight and just really you know you know uh, get yeah elephant stomping with the tremors <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know about elephant stomping um no i i think in the in the short term let's say sprint and t-mobile married got married tomorrow um moving you're gonna have to explain the now. cheers reference too by the way <laughs> no, it's it's just a generic joke at every single sitcom where there's sexual tension between two characters. The will they? Oh, that that, that was based off of Cheers. And cheers I don't think yeah. any anyone else. I don't care. Sorry. That that was as much for me as it might have been for anyone old, my age or older. Um, <laughs> no, the 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 biggie is. Uh, sorry, my wife just got out of uh, Avengers Infinity War and I just got three texts from her oh. saying, I hated this film. I'm not joking. This film made me so angry. Well, at so... least she got a one plus six out of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so sorry, I just that just completely floored me there. I wasn't expecting such a visceral reaction from my wife, but she, I think she's <laughs> she's hit her superhero movie burnout uh limit uh already in april well no but i mean you know, we've been dealing with this since like blade um came okay. out in superhero films that's what i mean is like the overall uh superhero movie burnout but sorry so let's say t-mobile and sprint got married tomorrow as long as 
they had the right hardware on their phones, I could see an almost immediate benefit for former Sprint customers getting to piggyback on T-Mobile's network. They can in, have Project a, Fi without the freaking. Well, that's know, just that, that's just it. Is so so. Let's say you know, like if phones if phones on Sprint were properly built for international travel, international access, it should only take some software to open up the ability for that phone to juggle GSM and CDMA networks here in the United States. So that could be a, a, a significant well, perk yeah. for Sprint consumers right away. And it also would bring, I think, a, a, a subtle benefit to T-Mobile. You know, there, there are probably some areas where there are, you know, you might be closer to a Sprint tower than a T-Mobile tower and you would get to benefit from that signal hopping too. And then it would, it would radically simplify the number of devices that they would have to manage and sell moving forward. So you follow the T-Mobile strategy of, of, of their devices largely being unlocked versions with a couple preloaded apps, maybe. And then from there, I think you would you would see an easier consumer platform for selling these devices. You wouldn't have the same go, go the Deutsche Telekom route. And just like ha like freely choose which apps you want to preload, like that would be great. Oh yeah, that that would be cool too. But what I mean is, like, if you look at the catalog of phones being sold by T-Mobile and by Sprint, one carrier I feel does a little bit better in sourcing potential solutions for consumers and is a lot more flexible and is a lot easier for unlocked devices on their network. And I think that would be a boon to Sprint subscribers. Totally, you know. totally. Uh, I, t I totally, you know, understand that. Uh, I guess, uh, well, T-Mobile has always been a beneficiary of uh, Unlocked because uh, totally. they're they're not the leading carrier in the nation as opposed to AT&T and Verizon. They don't have any stake against, uh, they're, they're taking all the Unlocked uh, phones and whatnot. Uh, and uh, also the Sprint's uh, phones, modern phones, are to an extent gsm compatible but those are only world bands and i don't think there's uh, enough uh, cross venn diagram uh cross compatibility uh going on there because they have they, uh, sprint phones have to be working with uh gsm uh international carriers so yeah that's uh that's something to be mindful of and, but in any case from from yeah. the wife uh avengers infinity war nothing about this movie was redeeming you want to bring her on? Do you want to do it? Just get, call her up right like, now. We, we could do like a call in. I'd, I'd love to have a good plug in for like Google yeah, could... to patch directly into. Uh, yeah, let's our, let's this bring is, back. I'm sorry. The, the, the recap, the play by play on this is hilarious. So I'm, I'm definitely going to have to ask my oh, wife about that later. But uh, we should probably move on to something. Yeah, more. let's uh, let's, let's move on to uh, something <laughs> sort of gadgety, sort of software-y. Uh, let's talk about Apple and Shazam. A uh, couple of concerns here from the European Commission, and that's this is why they're doing their antitrust investigation. Uh, one is the data issue, that um, it can take all the data, uh, the referral data for customers uh, just trying to identify a track and okay, which service would you like to access? Spotify, Google Play, or Apple Music? They could use that data for competitive advantage. There is also the minor concern that um, uh, Shazam, well, it, it minor concern in the words of the European Commission, that Shazam could be limited to just referring to Apple Music, although I don't see much sense in uh, doing that for Apple in any case, but yeah. yeah. Uh, What's up here? <laughs> well, I mean, that just is we'll have to see where they eventually land on whether or not they consider this some sort of antitrust move. I just think that the stakes are going to be really low. I, uh, you know, we we have a variety of music scanning data collecting services. You know, you know your Google Assistant has this type of functionality built into it now. Um, there was like SoundHound and other services. It just isn't that big a deal anymore gleaning consumer behavior from them manually scanning music to try and find out what a song is or interacting with the service like that so to me this is something that i think is like i i don't think it's it's not worth examining corporate behavior over consumer identifiable information and behavior but let's say they 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 slam this down and they did they determine it that it is a major antitrust issue 
it won't really affect any current products or services as far as I'm aware of. You know, Apple Music isn't going to take a significant hit because they don't have a good platform for utilizing Shazam's algorithmic uh, music search. So I, I, I just don't, like, again, I, I'm going to go back to that earlier phrase. I just think the stakes are really low here. And the worst case scenario for Apple is still like kind of a shrug. It's, you yeah. know, I, I just don't think it's going to be a big deal. I mean, it's, you know, potentially because Apple, you know, since the iPod, they've branded themselves as being the place for music. And that's what they've been showing off with uh, Beats, uh, building that brand up and you know, adding these uh, radio services to it. And then also just you know, Apple Music and uh, to the detriment of iTunes and to downloads and the shifting landscape of uh, how we listen to music, they, they still want to be a place for that kind of media and you know be the center and again car carpool karaoke like they were able to grab onto that <laughs> right. like it's just it's but you know that's you about, know, like the sonic brand they have a sonic brand and you like one know. of the things like this might be a, a a worse look for apple in this one case because we're talking about apple buying a company which uses a consumer's device to scan behavior and scan the audio around them to to listen for oh but we're, we're going to keep it private we're going to it's going to be well, safe this, this, this is why I think it's, 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 this is a worse look for apple than what we normally talk about for apple services is because apple would be leveraging that acquisition of consumer behavior to try and better market other services that people can buy but why I also feel like the stakes are super low here is that it's still in Apple's bucket of an ecosystem. It would be augmenting Apple Music, which, again, people would either already be subscribed to or you just deal with Apple saying, like, you should buy Apple Music. You say no, and then you get on with your life. And that this is way less intrusive, in my opinion, way less intrusive than the way that Amazon and Google collect information on you to sell similar products and services. So again, even if this ends up being, you know, falling into some kind of worst case scenario for Apple Music and Shazam, I still don't think it's going to be, there, there's going to be much ado. You know, I, I think this is going to be one to pretty easily shrug off and just get on with their lives and incorporate similar mechanics into Siri and then have that be the, the leveraged utilization of consumer behavior within if they ever get consumers. back to incorporating features into siri <laughs> <laughs> well but i mean that would be a motivator wouldn't it you know like oh we can't use shazam yeah. darn well here's almost exactly the same thing built on internal uh apple developers uh utilization of consumer behavior well, to sell you they've exactly been, they've the been product. hiring but i i just i, I don't know I, We'll have to see because <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I, I want, I want Siri to, to succeed in, in some aspect, but again, well, ultimately, it's, it's... I want to see, I want to see what the commission has to say about this, but if the commission comes cracking down hard on Apple here, where, where are they going to fall on Google? You know, <laughs> oh, they, they've, they've already like screwed with Google so much. I mean, the right to forget and uh, also just other uh, default search engine choices. I mean, they, they, they don't have any more bones to pick unless Google grows them with uh, seeds and soil. Yeah, but but I, I this is again like if, if, if I'm going to try and put on my fairness cap. If they come crashing down on Apple and Shazam and like Amazon music just sort of skirts the room without the same kind of scrutiny, then I feel like consumers have a good uh, have have a good uh, good faith argument to be made for some type of regulatory overreach or oversight into how other corporations are also utilizing consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, the impending doom not but it's still impending uh again some of these changes uh that the fcc has uh voted on published in its rules for the repeal of net neutrality uh require budgetary uh changes and that requires signing off from uh the director of the office of management and budget mick mulvaney and uh, there hasn't been any movement on this well and it's already been four days since other rules were taken into effect so there's there's a whole bunch of reasons that this could be happening but um i don't know uh harold feld of the wet machine uh blog network has a few takes on this that suggest hey maybe the 
the the industry, the internet industry, is uh, is working on uh, a bill that would ensure internet bill of rights or whatever the heck, but would have some back doors for them to be able to take advantage of that. You know, they're crafting legislation. And they want to pass it through Congress. Maybe uh, the government is winning on that, but we're in a midterm year, so it's kind of a yeah. it, we're kind of in a in a in a rut, and we're yeah, we're, we're in the same regulatory uncertainty that FCC Chairman Ajit Pai has been talking about for three years in terms of these freaking rules being in effect for Title II and whatnot. And now he's just there's just this big hole in terms of all right, is our internet freedom restored yet? <laughs> well, I, I don't feel like any of that was needed. Um, well, there there are a lot of things that are that are moving parts here. One, uh, the frustration of what Ajit Pai sold conservatives in saying we were going to restore internet freedom was always specious because. This is this is an extremely complicated machine. If if you're out there ranting and railing, I don't want the government in my internet. The government is not one thing. The government is an insane collection of tiny pieces and parts, all with varying levels of power to execute policy. So Ajit Pai grossly oversimplified the process of 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 deleting Title II after it was enacted. If you've just thought he was capable of going in and saying, we're going to hold a vote, the vote is is affirmed, and now we're going to remove net neutrality, and you believed him on that, then he essentially misrepresented what he was capable of doing, and he lied to you. Um, you know, he, he, he oversold his ability to get this done. At the same time, we're also seeing uh, numerous lawsuits over the repeal of Title II regulations. We're seeing numerous states involved in state policy to enact even stricter net neutrality policy than what the FCC was going to be in charge of. And we are also dealing with- And that's, that's despite the fact that the act says that this uh, this law supersedes any state which, law. In, which is an immediate yeah. which is an immediate circuit court or Supreme Court issue. Because then yep. now we, if, if you're a conservative, now we need to have that conversation on state versus federal rights. The state of California says we want even stricter net neutrality guidelines than what the FCC repealed. Where do you fall? Are you internally consistent in your conservative ideology and protecting states' rights above the federal government and allowing California to do business in the way that California citizens see fit? Or are you going to fight us on federal overreach of restricting states' rights? Well, it's a, it's a liberal state and that and that argument doesn't apply. But it's it's a, like these are always, you know, a means to another means to a certain point of the day, point well, de jour. Yeah, and but, it's, but, it's like but, always. No, 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 no. That, that's that's where I, that's where I'm frustrated with politicians, both liberal and conservative politicians. Well, but even I, the, having, the discourse, even the I'm discourse having, has been. If I'm having a good faith conversation with a conservative or a libertarian individual outside of the realm of government. I, I try to remain internally consistent on my liberal ideology. And if liberals in California decide through a popular vote that the preferred method that they wish to do business on the Internet is through some sort of net neutrality protecting legislation, that is a state's right. And that should supersede what the federal government can enact through a diminished regulatory agency like the FCC. So again, those those kinds of conversations are all coming to a head at the same time that both Ajit Pai and um, so, uh, several uh, FCC appointees appointed by uh, the FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, are also under investigation for potential collusion with the uh, very agencies, uh, the very corporations this agency is tasked with regulating. So this, by, by removing a lot of the power and authority of the FCC, the timing on this is actually really bad for the FCC being able to change policy. So their resources are already stretched thin because conservatives love to gut regulatory agencies like the FCC. And that means their ability to enact policy is further reduced, even when the policy they're trying to enact is a rollback that conservatives are in favor of. So 
again, they've completely oversold what they were capable of doing. They've been working to diminish what they're capable of doing. And that's also affecting the timeline of what they promised they would be able to do. All of this goes this, hand in I mean, hand. All, all of this shouldn't stop ISPs from already uh, just cranking down the hammer on what they want to do because FCC's enforcement bureau, even though oh, but, it has been but, but I would, putting I would out say... some pretty good stuff recently, and no, the but... FTC well, and the FTC, which is already a small enough bureau as it is, like yeah, those but, people can't but, really. But Jules, we've been seeing the lobster pot on that happen already. I mean, oh, yeah, totally. On a, on a bunch of those stories too, you know, like Verizon already holding tests on their network on how to throttle competing services like Netflix. We've been watching in numerous areas of the country start lighting up even more restrictive data caps in areas that are already underserved competition. We're we're also seeing, uh, you know, of it's very slow at the state level, rolling back regulations on things like uh, community funded broadband or initiatives that would improve competition in areas that are only served by one major supplier. I totally agree. I'm just waiting for the floodgates. And, you know, uh, no, if no, no, no. there I, aren't I, any fl floodgates, then maybe I, the carriers I, have a long, uh, have, or service providers have a long game in mind that they want to be able to be completionist on. No, 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 no. This is also why I think we're seeing the pause that we are. We'll, we'll see a very quiet announcement that the FCC is stepping aside, probably before or during some other major announcement. I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if like a three day weekend, they deliver the news like 5 p.m. on a Friday to say, oh, yeah, and net neutrality is dead. Goodbye. And then like, you know, kind of walk out. But at the same time, ISPs aren't going to rush to suddenly eliminate a ton of protections because yeah. what they want is the first wave. They want that first week. At the end of the first week of net neutrality, you're going to have a whole bunch of conservative news outlets saying, see, look, nothing changed. The internet still works. Everything's fine. And from there, ISPs and carriers get to lobster pot up whatever dastardly revenue generating policy that they wish by eliminating net neutrality. That's that's always going to be the game. But no, that's also why we've been seeing so many little pushes and little um, little policy changes from major companies. Verizon relocking smartphones. You know, they're trying to see what they can get away with and how how far they can push the public in individual steps. And they can push the public pretty far on tech stuff. They don't the American populace does not pay attention to tech like they should. So yeah. it, it won't be soon after the official repeal that I think we'll see these corporations start the process of changing a policy. But at the same time, you're not wrong. We're leading into a midterm election with a very unpopular uh, current administration. They would be foolish to push too far right before a potential change of control or a change of power in the House of Representatives, because then they would be changing policy at exactly the time that they would be under the most scrutiny from Congress. So again, I think it's going to be to their to their benefit. Not that I, th I have any faith that they'll do this well, but it'll be to their benefit to slow play this, to make the uh, American population feel secure that nothing bad is going to happen before they start driving up prices, start throttling services and start restricting access. Um, at the same time, they also have to spend a lot of money lobbying and placating politicians, which is why we need to be ever more vigilant as consumers and enthusiasts of technology. Well, I mean, there are concerns here. I mean, how long are they going to do this for? Because we have elections every major elections every two years. They can't just say, oh, we're going to do this on month 17 in between healthcare again and yeah. infrastructure and what whatnot. Like there, there's just a whole, again, you said it, moving parts. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and this is also another thing too, is, you know, from, from the corporation standpoint, it's infuriating watching pendulum swing politics happen every two and four years. Like <laughs> if you try and, and, and craft a, a corporate structure and you try and get your ship moving in one direction, then two years later, a new administration or or a new crop of senators and congressmen come into play and start start really dismantling the things that you were going to be basing your corporate policy on then it becomes extremely difficult to have long-term forecasts and long-term uh long-term goals that make any kind yeah. of sense and that, so, that's why these companies would prefer bait like case law or legislated law and like as opposed to just yeah. uh, proclamations from uh, some guy yeah. on a dais. Yeah.
no that that's so, exactly I mean, what yeah. i was driving towards <laughs> no ex- no i totally agree with you there uh so with that uh with the news over and done with let's uh hit up some mail why don't we uh, do it we've got two really great really great emails here so I'm, yeah. I'm stoked to take a stab at both of these yeah indeed so uh let's start off with uh wasim suke uh talking about mac book uh, MacBooks and whatnot. Hey, Jules and Juan, I like the discussion about a possible 799 MacBook, and uh, I believe Apple should bring out uh, such a MacBook for no other reason than who else can possibly compete with Microsoft Windows, Intel, and AMD in the laptop race. Linux has its very specific fans. I'm a partial fan of Linux, but would like to see a MacBook be more price competitive with Windows laptops. And I think there's still some things you can't do on a cut down version of windows and chrome os if apple does do a cheaper macbook they'll do it right well i I think um i think lewis lewis rossman uh that apple repair tech would likely disagree that apple can do it right i just saw one of his more recent videos detailing like the last 15 years of macbook construction and how like every single mac has had these amazing problems um but I don't... casey johnston's like the 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 celebrity uh of of point recently just from being you know, that that stupid uh uh butterfly switch article for the outline <laughs> right but he was even talking about things like the original macbook that claimed to have a unibody design actually didn't it didn't. had this glue point that the fans would melt the glue and then cause your screen to snap and you're like holy crap i remember that all these people talking about their unibody macbooks like having these snapping hinges but i digress the thing that i really wish apple would do is come back to the ibook you have branding there you have an imac and you have a mac pro you have a macbook why not have an imac and then you would instantly train the consumer to understand that that was going to be a medium tier product. It was going to probably be made out of like polycarbs and plastics and lower weight. Um, uh, You know, you didn't need to have bleeding edge processor and storage uh, storage designs. You could glue that thing shut just like every other laptop manufacturers now sealing, preventing consumers from getting into the guts of their machine. I think Apple could do really well uh, reviving the iBook and also having sort of a nostalgia campaign about, oh, remember how funky fresh these plastic laptops used to be and clamshells and fun, fun, funky colors and people dancing. You have to acknowledge what a computer was. (laughs) Because apparently post-millennial children have no idea what computers are. F that. (laughs) I mean, they're already past that in their own marketing timeline, in their own universe. Like they can't, it has to fit the headcanon, man. The the, the Apple reality distortion alternate universe. Um, No, but I think I, I, I would be very surprised if Apple ever undercut the, the luxury idea of a MacBook that if you, if you put MacBook on a product, it should be a high-end premium device. So I don't think they should water down that branding. Because again, one of the major things Apple has going for it is the emotional relationship with brands. Brands like iPhone, brands like MacBook, brands like iMac. But I think you could make a huge argument to have a new, super clean, lower cost iBook in your Apple store sitting right next to an iMac. And I think running an ARM based processor or something like that. Yeah. Consumers would instantly recognize the value there. And you could probably like to your point. And again, you're, you, you beat me by, by uh, just a couple of sentences there, Jules, to that point, you could also use the iBook as your leverage to start moving laptop consumers more towards an iOS style ecosystem. Imagine an iBook, which is essentially an i uh, uh, an iPad with a clamshell keyboard, touchscreen, modular design, ARM powered, mostly app focused. You beef up some of the stock oh, apps well, so that they look. That would more totally like the be desktop. a watered down experience. And my name is Tim Cook. <laughs> but I think you could make a big play. I think consumers would join you. I I, I would be excited about something like that being a, a lower cost. Maybe you know again in that five to seven hundred dollar territory 
but make it an iPad laptop and people will trip over themselves to say how revolutionary, how forward thinking. Yes, this is this is a good fit in every single way that most tech pundits uh, pooped all over Windows 10 S. Windows 10 S was too early. Microsoft doesn't have the apps. No one wants this, but Apple can do this right will be the commentary. And I think you could make a huge play by reviving the iBook name. I'm just being too much of a cynic for this segment. Uh, segment. Let's uh, move on to Emil <laughs> Matthew Eskendor, who writes, Greetings. I happen to have come across a Verge article claiming that high megapixel count on selfie cameras doesn't really matter. Having been already mentioned on many reputable sources of Oppo's release of its F7 selfie master phone, so, because of course it has to be the selfie master. Uh, I was kind of wondering what's your say to this direction on evolving selfie megapixel count. Pocket now subscribers since 2015 and still rocking it. Cheers and more right. power to all of you. So thank you, Emil, from that. Well, and uh, yeah, and did, like, you, uh, did you read the 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 Verge article? I I, I caught it just. Uh, it was just article. a quick. No, it was a quick uh, rundown of, oh, it, less lights, more megapixels, and because, uh, well, they don't say in the article itself, but just because uh, sensor size is, uh, you know, as small as it is for a selfie sensor, typically, uh, it's not really going to be effective in low light, and uh, that's where a lot of selfies are taken. So, fair points. Uh, there's only going to be so much that, like, a screen flash uh, would do. It can do, yeah. Although yeah, Apple so is usually pretty aggressive about putting in things like front facing flashes. Um, yeah, and they're 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 getting into the whole AI thing and you know, just making sure that people know that their cameras are smarter and can output brighter stuff without with less noise and whatnot. So, so, so yeah, I don't I know. Read, There's a gives and gives and takes. Yeah, I read this article. This is from Jacob Castron uh, Castronaquez. Um, I've probably mispronounced his last name, and I apologize. Uh, th there's one major part of this article that to your point there jules that i feel is completely lacking and that's when all other technologies are equal an increase in resolution will deliver poorer low light performance their their article just sort of takes it for granted that let's say we had camera sensors with backside illumination hardware image stabilization uh different sensor sizes a bigger sensor can soak up more light than a smaller sensor that a 25 megapixel uh selfie shooter would be undesirable because of low light performance so unfortunately even though they've got this article they could have spared one extra sentence to say all other technologies being equal higher resolution or more pixel dense sensors perform poorer in low light environments. But I think they've also missed um, some other aspects here, or, or I feel like we could be having a chicken and the egg debate. They, they make a, the Verge makes a point out of calling out certain types of consumer behaviors. Like you take your, your selfie picture and you don't want to see the pores in your face or you don't want to do a lot of cropping. And that's what high resolution sensors are for. And I, and I think I would be inclined to agree, we don't see a lot of people doing a ton of cropping or a ton of really close up editing on selfie photos, but is that because they don't want to do that? Or is it because selfie cameras don't deliver images that are worth editing or cropping? You know, you know so they go on to mention, you know, a Samsung selfie camera might only have an eight megapixel sensor. Well, if Samsung delivered a 20 megapixel front facing shooter, do you think we'd maybe see a few more people editing or cropping? And I think I think we could. I think we might. You know, I think that could be something that some people might be interested in. But I mean, the there's only so much thing, field of view to crop from. But practically speaking, you'd have well, yeah, you'd be taking a chance on a better quality selfie. And but, I also that, can see. Also... Yeah. Oh, sorry. So go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your point. And I'll... No, it was uh, just one thing about uh, you know more face facial recognition features as as people just keep on shove them in like like it means nothing to them but you know just having more pixels and being you know if you're able to ensure at least a certain amount of accuracy just by having more pixels and being able to selectively choose which ones would uh, be your data points for the facial map then yeah i mean I, I i see it as a good potential yeah so the the other thing that i would point to in this article is is also taking certain behaviors for granted in a context of uh the 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 forward reach of computational photography and computational editing um 
you know, uh, looking at lo- looking at uh, different players. So, so I mean, you were saying field of view. Um, if I f- pull out uh, a Sony Xperia, um, like like you know, I, I've spent some time with uh, the XZ One. Um, the XZ One actually has a really wide lens and computationally does a great job of changing the sort of fisheye look of your photos from the actual lens into something that's a more normal field of view. So if I had that on a 25 megapixel sensor, I could shoot a lot wider and then have much better resources to crop in on an image that I thought looked good for me and the person that I was with or trying to capture some element in the background. And again, that's software. You know, you don't need three different camera sensors to achieve that. Like the experiment, the early experiment with the uh, the LG V10. Um, having multiple front-facing camera shooters just so you could have different uh, uh, focal length lenses. But the last thing kind of comes down into where we're seeing trends go with phones like the Pixel. If you have a 25 megapixel camera sensor, you can do things like pixel bin much more effectively. So you can capture a higher quality, lower resolution image by combining the pixel data of a higher resolution camera and arriving at a lower resolution final output, um, depending on what articles you read, because I did a little homework on this, um, you can expect something akin to a four to one signal to noise ratio, which helps significantly when it comes to capturing selfie or capturing any kind of photo in indoor lighting or in low light conditions. I don't now, believe that, be, that Oppo that... is gonna give us that, but that's another potential like what we see on Sony rear cameras where the normal rear camera delivers an eight megapixel image but it's got a 23 megapixel sensor and that's because they're taking all of that raw data cramming it down into a more social media friendly uh, file size and then also getting the benefit of increasing the amount of information per pixel decreasing the noise per pixel and arriving at a higher quality image for that image reduction Again, I don't think Oppo is going to do that, but there would be the potential to do something like that if you're investing in a more pixel dense front facing camera. How would you compare pixel bending to just having a larger pixel site? Uh, well, I'll let you drink your your water for a little break, and then well, I'll ask you about uh, that. <laughs> well, no, but depends on stretching. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. Um, so, so this this is all determined again. But it, it's it's tough to have a good answer to that because we have so many different technologies, differences in sensor sizes. Uh, you know, like is it a backside illuminated uh, camera sensor? Is it an optically image stabilized camera sensor? Is it a rapid burst camera sensor? Something that can clear information radically quickly so that you can. <clears throat> so that you can smash together four raw files um, into one final image and and maximize light and minimize noise that way. There are so many uh, different data points that we would look at, but ultimately, so many, yeah, so many of these great technologies that can be used all, in in some in some ideal cases all at once, especially with dedicated ISPs that are supposed to be AI enhanced again these days. Well, but 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 again, if if we could hypothetically come up with a situation where somehow we had exactly the same sensor size, exactly the same sensor technologies and exactly the same support technologies like OIS, and the only difference was individual photo site size, then we would I think we would arrive at something where the differences would be negligible, you know, so let's say you had a. Let's say again, you'd want to keep it somewhat consistent. So you you would you would have a camera that had like eight megapixels on on a certain surface area and one that had thirty two megapixels on the same sur- surface area. Then when you pixel bin, we should expect that the differences in photo site should be nearly the same. You know, mm-hmm. a four to one image reduction. So that should be pretty close. And again, we're talking about scientific differences to the human eye, which the human eye probably couldn't detect. And then you would also have the benefit of being able to shoot in good light at 32 megapixel megapixels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that one I didn't do on purpose. Um, 32 megapixels, whereas the other camera would still be stuck at an eight megapixel uh, image. So you start playing with some of these differences. Like I'm, I'm wrapping up my time with the honor view 10 and even just doing simple, simple crops, you know, like I've got a little bit more room to manipulate an image than I do on a Samsung. 
because there's a, a resolution advantage on this phone that costs $300 less, you know? So again, it's, it's never a one-to-one, -one, this is good, this is bad. And this is why I feel the Verge article is looking at one specific data point and has blinders on to the realities of all of the other mechanics at play when what makes a good camera and especially how important software is to this whole equation now the 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 post processing and the software manipulation of our images is kind of the biggest deal going right now for manufacturers as to what makes a good camera and what makes a poor camera um just focusing on the resolution isn't necessarily isn't in my opinion very constructive mm. well well put a resolution on this podcast for well, now I mean, basically but... the verge is wrong so <laughs> <there you go. laughs> that is the resolution of this podcast the verge is wrong J <laughs> jacob karastanakis some some name i'm sorry sir but <laughs> you are wrong and that is the stance of the pocket now weekly well but but you know again it's is i i have one piece in my upcoming view 10 uh camera review it doesn't really matter. I mean, however good you make the highest end bestest selfie camera, it still pales in comparison to even a lot of entry level phones, rear facing camera. Like why, if you really like taking pictures of yourself, get good at using the rear camera and you will take substantially better pictures of yourself. I can't stress this enough. Get a little practice in shooting blind and your your photo quality improves tremendously uh, for the final output. These these front facing I, cameras are really only good at keeping you looking at someone in a video call. That's 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 my my main opinion on it. I totally agree, Juan. I mean, the thing is, you're joking, but you've lined up a pretty good shot, Jules. And I know you've got another <laughs> webcam to help you do that. But <laughs> now that you see where the camera is in relation to your face. It only takes Just a little bit of practice to, 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 to remember that. <laughs> I mean, it's I hilarious. So anyway, yeah, that's that's my feeling on it. Uh, selfie cameras shouldn't be given any of the... Uh, we shouldn't be focusing overall on phone design to the degree that we have. And if you delivered a phone tomorrow that didn't even have a selfie camera, I, it would affect me very, very little in the overall use of my phone the biggest bummer would be no video calls and i'm pretty sure i could get over it i don't i don't think it would be a, a complete deal breaker for me i'm i'm in a, definitely a minority there but you know i these these cameras are, are universally kind of terrible so yeah i mean but but, but oppo the selfie master they they, they right. are the masters of yeah of you, can, you can be you can be the master of the the worst feature on a phone you are the best of the worst good job <laughs> we I should probably we should... wrap it up yeah before you incriminate yourself a little bit more before i piss off every single manufacturer who might want to send a phone to pocket now uh folks there you have it another episode of the pocket now weekly has come and gone want to throw a huge shout out because again this was a, a listener mailbag week and we got some great emails to talk about definitely keep those coming our way join the conversation in the live chat during the broadcast using the pn weekly hashtag or if you're listening to this after the fact hit that email uh, podcast at pocketnow.com. This show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where you can find Jules as at Point Jules, and I'm humbly at Some Gadget Guy. Pocket Now is around the web on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google Plus, YouTube, and our home site, pocketnow.com. And shows like this cannot exist without your support. Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and dropping reviews anywhere you can review a podcast so we can help get more eyes and ears on the show. Once again, we want to thank this week's sponsor, Intercom. Again, intercom.com slash growth to help you qualify leads and schedule demos and really get some of this manual work done for you and your business. Uh, you know, they're helping us keep the lights on, but ultimately there wouldn't be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure you tune back in. Oh man, I'm just reading about Sprint and T-Mobile going into a $26 billion deal, perhaps on Sunday. So yeah, uh, more work for us. Bye. More work for us. Bye.